Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to join my colleagues who spoke before me in expressing support for the motion before this House. Mr. Speaker, I ask your permission to express condolences to the Joseph family of Cicera, Diana Joseph, 96 years, was the matriarch of the Joseph family, wife of Rudens Joseph, a founding member of the St. Lucia Labour Party, and many meetings discussing the formation of the St. Lucia Labour Party took place at her home, and she would recall preparing supper and meals for many of the founders of the Labour Party as they sat with George Charles to form our great party. And she is a lady who everyone would tell you was one of the most lovable souls that you'd ever meet. And at the same time, Mr. Speaker, that, that I am expressing condolences, I want to, as I will not have an opportunity before, express you know, the satisfaction at seeing yet another constituent in Castro South reach the milestone of 100 years in the next two days. Felicite Sonny, the matriarch of the family. And I pray that God will allow her to see her birthday on first day. She's from a family of many others who've reached that milestone. And certainly on first day in Barca Joseph, there will be a, a grand celebration. Mr. Speaker, this motion comes before this house in rather trying times. We all know the consequences that COVID had on our nation, on our people, and on our economy. We inherited the government in July 2021, and the Prime Minister made it very clear then that he had to, as a matter of priority, to stabilize the economy. There was a lot of borrowing by the previous government. We all knew that they had to be borrowing because of the consequences of COVID. Virtually the world shut down on us. And with our economy so dependent on tourism, you can imagine the severe consequences that it would have had. I think everyone in here would remember in the early part of 2020, we were being told in this house that the economy was so well managed that things were booming and that we were on a steady course. And you would remember, Mr. Speaker, we stood in this house and we asked the then government, the then Minister of Finance, the member from Miko South, how could you last month say to us things were so good, it was booming, and then unexpectedly COVID hit us, shut down, and then we crash. Now, it would not have been unusual if other islands suffered the same fate we suffered. Well, we all suffered the same fate, but ours was exceedingly worse. Why, if we were doing so well, we were the best performing, the same event confronted all of us, but we came out the worst for it. Now, we can argue on opposite sides about who is better at managing the economy, but the truth is there for everyone to see, and that truth is guided by facts. By facts. And we cannot contest that. The fact is St. Lucia did the worst in the Caribbean because of the COVID pandemic. And it led to a significant amount of borrowing beyond what other territories had to do. And it is because of how this country was managed. Now, again, we can spend a lot of time arguing who is right and who is wrong. The point is, the previous government took a certain pathway which proved to be disastrous. Our task when we came in was to steady the ship. We did not have the luxury of going out and borrowing excessively or without discretion, as a member from Cassius North just stated. So this Prime Minister has had to be exceedingly cautious 
and deliberate in the decisions that he has made. But Mr. Speaker, important in all of this is the whole role of tourism. And I want to say a few things before I come back to the, the point I was making. We all understand how important tourism is. And when COVID hit, how it affected us. Mr. Speaker, equally important for us as a tourism destination, and more so one which is starting to promote with greater vigor the notion of community tourism, of creating authentic experiences, and saying we want our visitors to leave the resorts more than before and to visit the communities. That is what we're selling now. There's a clear reason why we are doing so. It comes back to the core of our economic philosophy that more St. Lucians should participate in the tourism industry and more St. Lucians should own the tourism industry. That is a core of our developmental trajectory. And it has been there from times, but now this historical moment requires us to push that agenda more than ever. More than ever. Because the Prime Minister himself in an earlier life was one of the architects of that approach. And I'm only continuing that whole approach that has characterized our notion of what tourism should be all about. So we are saying visitors should go out to the communities more. We are saying communities should build more assets that can attract visitors. But in all of that, Mr. Speaker, the events of the last few days really tells us how difficult the task is. Let's not deny it. And the member from Strozel Saltibus call on everyone to play their part to fight the scourge of crime that we are facing. And he expressed his support for the Commissioner of Police and the words of the Prime Minister. And I want to join all of them in saying, Mr. Speaker, that if we are to succeed and fulfill the dream and the vision that we have, we must endeavor to win this battle against the monster that crime is, Mr. Speaker. I know, Mr. Speaker, I can recall as far back as 1987, Mr. Speaker, I was then a youth leader. The member from Castries North will remember that. It had gotten to a point in St. Lucia where the then Minister of Education, Louis George, and his permanent secretary was then Dr. Frederick, and his chief education officer, Dr. Michael Louis, thought it necessary to form a national task force on indiscipline in St. Lucia because the indiscipline was starting to raise its head in St. Lucia in an unprecedented manner. And I recall I was the NYC, the youth rep, on that national task force. And I remember we presenting a paper to the task force where we said to the then government that we were going to face severe consequences in the future if we did not invest more on the development of our human resources in St. Lucia. Now, the UDLP government of that time was a very prudent government. If you study our political history, the political economy of St. Lucia, you will get a lot a, a, a deeper understanding of the approach to economic development then. It was a government that did not invest heavily monies that they thought they did not have, that they, they, they had a certain approach to it. And we're not passing judgment. We're not being normative. We just said it is what it is, what it was. And we in the NYC were saying, no, invest in the future, invest in our people. In those days, Mr. Speaker, children, there was no national stadium, there was no cricket ground. You know, the, the, the facilities for young people, we felt was not enough. In fact, some of us supported the member from Castries North becoming Minister of Youth because we believed then that he understood our language and that he would have made a difference. Although, I must admit, we told him we ain't sure he's going to succeed because within that setting, he didn't understand that kind of language. He was not blue yet, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we were not investing in our people. 
We were calling on the government to have a clear cultural policy to invest in creative industries as far back as 1987. I, Mr. Speaker, as far back as that. But it was not heeded. I was a teenager then. And we were saying in the years to come, we will pay the price for not creating that enabling environment in St. Lucia where our young people can thrive and grow, Mr. Speaker. I remember in 1997, Mr. Speaker, when the Labour Party came into power and we spoke of universal secondary education, there were people who criticised us for even thinking that every child in St. Lucia should go to secondary school. Think about that. When we announced we had every child in St. Lucia can now go to a secondary school, they said we were wasting money because some children are too lazy to go to secondary school. That they should leave school at six four at standard six. And we said no. As much as the system might not be perfect, it's better to send them to secondary school. We started vocational education. It had been started by the previous UWP government, but we tried to take it to a different level altogether with the construction of the Cicero Secondary School and in view for the technical school. Mondido was built. Mr. Speaker, all because we believe that you must invest in your people to create an environment where your people see opportunities in life and social ills and social degradation would be less of a pathway to take, Mr. Speaker. Today, the chickens have come home to roost, Mr. Speaker. We have a problem. And there have been successful pri successive prime ministers. The member from Castries North has had to deal with the problem. The member from Dufort South has had to deal with the problem. The member from Miku South has had to deal with the problem. This is not a new problem. I must say to your social media makes it appear in a way which we were not accustomed to before. But it is not a new problem, Mr. Speaker. It's not a new problem. And each former prime minister, the actually former prime ministers, each of them can give you their own experiences. A member from Beaufort South will tell you the number of police stations he built, the number of vehicles he bought, the legislation he changed. The member from Cassius North can tell you about his own attempts, equally the member from Miko South. So the challenge, Mr. Speaker, has been there successively facing government after government. It is now our turn to try to solve it. And I believe, Mr. Speaker, we can solve it. We have to solve it. If we are to succeed, Mr. Speaker, we have to find a way to solve this challenge we have before us. And when challenge is before you, it is not a time to run for shelter. It's a time to stand up and to be counted, Mr. Speaker. And this government will stand up and be counted, Mr. Speaker. So as we offer condolences to all the victims of crime, Mr. Speaker, we want to say to St. Lucians that we must fight collectively to overcome this menace we have, to overcome this threat to our society, Mr. Speaker. We have to do it. We may not even know exactly how to do it, but we know we must fight. We must do something, Mr. Speaker. I don't know the answers. I can't tell you. I have my own common sense solutions that I can give. But I know we must fight collectively. And when you heard about the citizens meeting yesterday, announcing their own program to fight crime, I want to applaud them, Mr. Speaker. I want to encourage them, Mr. Speaker. And I'm, I've said to the Prime Minister that I want for us in the next budget, and he agreed with me totally, he said to me, you were thinking just like me, we're on the same page, to give more money to the churches who have more crusades, to go out there and play their part equally, to give more money to youth groups, to give more money to the sporting organizations. Let us spend more in the social intervention programs, Mr. Speaker. We have to, Mr. Speaker. You see, this, uh, I, Mr. Speaker, I also remember in 1997, when the Labour Party came into power, Mr. Speaker, when we saw the level of youth unemployment and what was going on, we started the STEP program. You, you know, Mr. Speaker, others may not know. I was the one who, Dr. Anthony, a member from Beaufort South, had 
given the responsibility to start the STEP program. And I was the first chairman of, 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 of STEP. And we did so because we wanted to create opportunity for persons who had been deemed the unemployables in St. Lucia. And we were criticized. We were giving money away. We were making mendicants of people. Even in the elections in the 2016, that same thinking was perpetuated. Because they believe when you have social intervention programs that you're making mendicants of people, you're throwing away money, that instead you should give it to the private sector. I'm not saying the private sector should not get, but that cannot be the only solution, Mr. Speaker. So we are determined as a government. We're going to fight this through law enforcement. We're going to fight it through social interventions. And social interventions will carry the full range of options from the religious, the spiritual, the community, right through, Mr. Speaker. But we must also fight it in the international arena, Mr. Speaker, because I've said it before, we do not manufacture guns in St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker. We don't. And recently we had a presentation on money laundering, you know, the, the, the whole framework that exists. And we've been asked to look critically at the financing of terrorism and the financing of the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction in St. Lucia. And we ask the question, who is looking after the financing and the trafficking of small arms? Because truth be told, terrorism is not a threat to us. Um, weapons of mass destruction is not a threat to us. But trafficking of small arms and the financing of that trafficking is a threat to us. And we must let our voice be heard internationally and call on the countries that manufacture those guns to take responsibility for the consequences of them. And the transshipment routes, somebody has to take responsibility for it. We cannot believe we can fight this on our own. And the member from Strozel, Soldibus, was right. It comes down, despite all the complexity of crime, it comes down to a fundamental point. There are too many guns on the streets. How did they get here? Who's bringing them? Who's financing them? We cannot solve that on our own. We can do as much as we can in our own confined space of St. Lucia, but there's a bigger force that can overwhelm us. So do not believe we can solve this problem by social intervention or by changing legislation or just law enforcement. We have to call on the international community to recognize what is happening to us. If some countries are concerned about terrorism and about the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, we must put on the agenda our concern too. And this government will have to do so. We will have to do so, Mr. Speaker. And we need to let all St. Lucians know you must be brave, you must be courageous. You must believe in our capacity as a people that we can overcome this challenge. It is what lies before us. And if we are going to develop this country into a prosperous nation, we must overcome this challenge. And we have the capability to do so. So let us start working together to do so. We must not be soft on crime. We must be understanding of the circumstances that can cause one to go into crime. But we must never be soft on it, Mr. Speaker. I have had over the last two to three months, not two months, Mr. Speaker, to know some individuals I know personally, personally lose their life because of gun violence in my constituency. Personally. And over the next few days, I have to participate in the funeral of another one, Mr. Speaker, a lovely young lady, Mr. Speaker, who lost her life, Mr. Speaker. So all of us as parliamentary reps probably know individuals who were affected. We have to dedicate ourselves as leaders as well to do what is necessary to fight this threat that we, we face, Mr. Speaker. And when I hear in a press conference the former Minister of Tourism boldly say to the world that we are hiding the figures that it affects tourist, crime against tourists because we want higher numbers in St. Lucia, it really makes you wonder, Mr. Speaker. Yes, as politicians, we sometimes undermine and we question and we challenge and, and we, you know, we take on each other, Mr. Speaker. Maybe they believe in their own minds 
and they say it all the time, oh, that's what y'all used to do. I know I never used to do that, and I know for a fact my colleagues would not like that. It doesn't mean we were not critical, but nobody gloats over the destruction of the country, Mr. Speaker. But maybe again, they're not from this country, Mr. Speaker. But that's another story for another day, Mr. Speaker. That's another story for another day. You know, Mr. Speaker, we cannot be happy when St. Lucia is facing a challenge such as this. We cannot be happy. You know, there are many other things you can criticize us about, Mr. Speaker, but certainly you cannot rejoice when the country is facing some of its darkest times, Mr. Speaker. But again, I keep saying, I know we will overcome, and I know we will succeed, and I know that e economic philosophy I spoke about of creating a prosperous nation by giving St. Lucians more opportunity and making them owners, Mr. Speaker, of the economic pillars of this country. We will achieve it. We will achieve it. I think, Mr. Speaker, this is why this borrowing becomes even more important. Because it is guided by a philosophy, Mr. Speaker, that always places people first, Mr. Speaker. Always. The Prime Minister, the member for Catherine East stood up and he listed the number of occasions we came into this parliament and borrowed monies. And five out of the seven, if my calculation was right, had nothing to do with new expenditure. It had to do with expenditure commitments made before we got into government, which we had to fulfill. And when the leader of the opposition posts how many times we've come to the house to borrow and how much we've borrowed, well, again, he believes misinformation is the way to go. But a lot of it was not even commitments made by us. And similarly, when you speak of $60 million in land acquisition, costs that has to be paid, that was not done by us in 17 months. It wasn't. But we have an obligation to meet those costs. We have. It, like the member from Cassius North said, it is grossly unfair to take somebody's property and make them suffer and wait for years to get their money. It's wrong. You talk about payables, Mr. Speaker. Over 100 and almost 170, 130, 130 odd million dollars in payables when we came in. In payables, or more than that, in payables, Mr. Speaker, do we say to those individuals, those service providers, that we were not in government, so therefore we will not pay you? It's been 17 months, Mr. Speaker. Some of them have not been paid. We have to pay, Mr. Speaker. The DFCs, Mr. Speaker. I mean, we've been through this before in this house. We are a responsible government. We've waited 17 months. We've tried to manage this economy to stabilize it, not to engage in excessive borrowing. Just manage it well enough that we do not put more pressure on our debt, debt stock, stock, Mr. Speaker. We've reached a point where we have to fulfill some of those obligations. So we've had to come to this house to fulfill what the Prime Minister said in his budget statement. And this is what we are doing today. This is what we're doing. So, Mr. Speaker, I am glad that we finally reach here today. We can take care of those outstanding matters, leftover bills from COVID, land acquisition, payables, and many others. We can clear this, Mr. Speaker. We have no choice, but we have to do it. And at the same time, Mr. Speaker, there are some new costs, of course. The operations of government must continue must continue. I hope in there, Mr. Speaker, there is something for the Bassa Joseph Community Centre, Mr. Speaker. But I hope so, Mr. Speaker, because, you know, I am patiently waiting. And I, I must say, Mr. Speaker, that I'm very thankful, Mr. Speaker, to the member from Cassius North and the Prime Minister member of Cassius East for the lovely roads we have in Marigo and Bassa Joseph right now, Mr. Speaker. I would also like roads in ba uh, Monkey Tong repaired too, Mr. Speaker, but I'll be a little patient. So, like the member from Babono who says she knows a lot of that money will be filtering down into Babono, I want some of it to filter down into the Bassa Joseph, Mr. Speaker, Community Center. 
And by the way, we're already using it, even if it's not finished. We'll have solo night there on December 21st. So those of you who follow solo can come and join us and listen to Wule Tete and some of the other groups perform, Mr. Speaker. Um, yes, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I really want to express my support to the, for the motion before us and to ask the Prime Minister to continue in this present approach. There's a lot I can say to speak about the community tourism program, to speak about the micro-enterprise fund, to speak about the youth economy. So much, Mr. Speaker, that we are doing to offer more opportunities for our people, to empower our people. It's a whole process of economic enfranchisement that is taking place in this country, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to accelerate it. So, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. I support this motion totally.